Picking up where we left off in episode 4, I'm using my Ryobi oscillating multi-tool with the corner sanding pad attached. I'm just going through and sanding out any rough patches while removing the hard film layer left behind from the hot wire foam cover. I'm also taking down any overhang from the top layer so that it matches with the vertical supports that were cut for the slope. I got my hands on some upholstery tack strip to use for my cardboard lattice. For this work, I used a variable temperature hot glue gun set to low temp. While I do have a Ryobi cordless hot glue gun, it gets extremely hot and melts through the foam. There is a link in the description for the upholstery tack strip I used. you can see, I tend to overdo it a little bit on my lattice work, but I want strength for where I lay down a plaster cloth. Each overlap is glued together with hot glue. I went through this section and masked off the roadbed and track to make sure I didn't get any plaster on these bits. Now I'm going through and adding the first layer of plaster cloth. The plaster cloth I'm using is Navaris brand and is 6 inches wide by 118 inches long per roll. I bought the 10 roll pack for $25. There is a link in the description for the pack I got. On this layer I dipped the plaster cloth into a bowl of water. Pull the plastic cloth out of the bowl. I like to give it a little bit of a shake just to get that excess water off. When you go to set it down, it makes it easier if you start farther out and then pull your plastic cloth into position and then just make your minor adjustments after that. If you find yourself with a bit of a dry spot, just dip your finger in the bowl and rub that over there and it'll, it'll wet it right up, no problem. The biggest key to plaster cloth is making sure that you rub it in effectively and massage it a little bit to get all that plaster spread out across the entire sheet.
I left this clip at normal speed just to give you a good idea how much time I put into just one piece of plaster cloth when I lay it down. Some people will use the square plaster cloth sheets you can get from like Woodland Scenics, but I prefer the rolls because you can just unroll it to the length you want, cut it, and it's all ready to go. Now I'm going through and adding a second layer of plaster cloth. This helps with filling in any gaps in the plaster. Added the second layer while the first layer was still damp. With this layer, I laid it down dry and used a squirt bottle to get it wet. This allowed me much more control over the amount of water I had to contend with. Hey guys, welcome to this episode of Empires, Season 3, Episode 5. This will be our last pre-recorded, and I've got a bit of material to cover in this particular episode. We're going to go from everything we built on the modules, roadbed, and everything up to this point, up through uh, the very basic landforms, all the way up to some ground cover that we can build on top of. So here I'm slapping a little paint down um, with the florist foam. That I'm working with, you don't want to soak it in paint, or you don't want a thick layer of latex paint. That is, um, you can't airbrush the stuff, and I've done that. That puts a thinner layer, or you could do the, you know, latex paint. But you probably want to spray some water. Uh, I keep spraying it. I've got everything wet here anyway. Uh, one little thing of note too that you'll see is uh, a little bit of paper tape or, or masking tape. Um, I've got a couple spots that I've been playing with the expanding foam, but I've had really good luck using uh, masking tape as basically a pseudo form to, to force the expanding foam into the shape that I want it so that it doesn't get out of control or it doesn't all run down the front of the mount facade. Uh, I mean, you can see that it's linked a little bit in one spot. And point is just to get some color on it quickly and I'm a big fan of very quickly getting color on to my ground, for, uh, ground forms or land forms so that I can see what it's going to look like, what to expect from it, see if I want to make adjustments and I like to look at this as early in the process as I possibly can so that I can make adjustments as quickly in the process as I possibly can. Part of the, one of the biggest reasons that I use foam of any type to work with versus plaster. Part of the reason I'm not a particularly big fan of plaster in most cases, um, it has use cases, but in most cases it's, it's because I find its modification process to be fairly messy. Uh, 
not very forgiving, um, and I'm much less reluctant to make changes, especially if they're kind of minor changes. With the foam, I can put paint on it, I can put dirt ground forms on it, I, a lot of times even after static grasses on it, I'll go back with the saw and make some minor changes, and cut into it, make adjustments that I'm afraid to. And you can see this is some florist foam and some pink foam. There's some pink foam uh, holding up the lane forms. I, I try to, to not use... The florist foam is expensive, so you want to, to use it where forestation will be heavy, uh, places where you're going to plant a, a lot of uh, forestation, and, um, and not use it so much in other places. So. Now this is a uh, uh, matte medium. Actually, that's Mod Podge, but Mod Podge is a, an artist medium as well. It's basically the same thing. It's just a, a medium consistency as opposed to a thinner consistency. I, I use both. Matte, matte medium is really good. Mod Podge is very available. I could just get it at the local store. I could just get it at Walmart. Um, whereas uh, matte mediums, you know, I've got to order them when I run out of it. I've got some right now, and I ordered a bundle of artist mediums recently. Um, per another gentleman's YouTube channel that, that I've become a fan of. A lot of people on YouTube would be keeping up with him and become a fan of uh, Boomer Dioramas. I'd really recommend his channel to anybody um, who keeps up with his stuff. He's one of the channels that I think some of us watch on YouTube. You'll see that I've I'm experimenting with some of his explained techniques uh, here in the next little bit, but I went and ordered some of the uh, modeling pastes that he's working with. I want to experiment with them. I've been making my own pastes with uh, the ground goop that I make. Uh, I make that in a bunch of different forms with uh, cellulose uh, insulation, the uh, non-treated kind. You don't want the, the kind that has animal retardants or fire retardants in it, you just want the, just the same less insulation. I make it with cellular clay or paper mache products sometimes, or I make my own from uh, various paper products, uh, typically toilet paper that's, that's, that I get wet and tear up with a, a wire wheel. So I've made my own artist mediums uh, quite a bit. Uh, I mix vermiculite in sometimes, I've mixed sand in sometimes, but I've, got, I've ordered some of the, and have a bunch of the gold uh, sanded materials per Boba Diorama's recommendation for those products, and I'm really excited to try those out. And I kind of work in a couple different spots at different times here. I'm slapping on the ground. I apparently, I apparently could not find my little plastic stick or my favorite uh, tool for working with this stuff. That didn't work very well, obviously, but uh, the paper or the, the wood stick is not working very good. The, the, the shim. Uh, I keep a bunch of uh, shims I could use to set a door with. Um, I use them to mix paint because I run out of paint stars all the time. I, I use them for a bunch of different reasons. They're handy to just pick up and grab as a scrap piece of wood to work with, but. My favorite uh, shaping tool is uh, Artist's Palette Brushes, or Palette Knives. I've got a bunch of different ones of those that I really like working with. Because I guess I don't think I had one up here at my workshop at the moment. But the good thing about Crowd Group is you can use it to fill in gaps, you can use it to shape, you can use it to fill in larger holes. It's, it's a very flexible medium. And I've given up to use my fingers. And that, that works really well for certain applications, especially if you get the ground group slightly wet or get your fingers wet, as I've been doing here. Um, it lets you really shape the material. You see the cat that ran by a second ago? I had some cats in my, my workshop recently, and they scared the crap out of me at random times. I cannot seem to get rid of them. progress through this video. Like I said, there's quite a bit of material to cover in this one. I've been shooting all month. 
video here, you'll see some, some considerable changes uh, to my progress here in a few minutes when we get there. Some that related to the workshop. Continually looking at the prototype photos on Google Earth to see how kind of the, the profiles and the roads and how things enter and how I could possibly compress those into something that is achievable in the amount of modeling space that I have. So I've already made changes quite a bit recently. So. But I want to get it covered up. I want to get color on it, turn on it pretty quickly, and then you know, then I'm not at all afraid to make changes. None of None of it's precious to me. That's one of the, the biggest things I think that works really well in my favor is that none of it's precious. I'm not afraid to tear anything out. Normally the things that I'm the happiest with in my modeling are the things I've done at least two or three times. Now this is the techniques that I, that I really, or at least the overarching philosophy that I've taken from Uber Di Dioramas that I'm really trying to apply here. So typically I've had a number of dirt and grout, um, just a bunch of different mixtures of, of, of contours and textures, and in textures of, of different uh, densities and different grades and different colors, and that I'm trying to get the color right um, at the time of application. And that's a really difficult process considering that glue changes the color of a lot of scenic mediums, a lot of scenic materials, it darkens a lot of them. Uh, grout doesn't tend to be as subjective to that as dirt is, for example, but what I'm starting to experiment with doing, and I'm very happy with the results I've been finding already, is putting down a medium that I like the texture of, and airbrushing, and getting all my color there. And it, and this has worked so well over the past month of me experimenting with it and shooting it in video that I think I'm committed to basically using um, whatever gives me the right grain or consistency and probably in a, a white or a light color allows me to see contours and shapes and, and flaws and errors more easily and then airbrushing everything. So, to be a paints. whatever I want you to do. And in that Nalgene bottle is 99% 99 alcohol. 99 alcohol. Uh, sadly, in the States, for some reason, at least where I am geographically, 99% 99 alcohol seems to be a little bit difficult to get a hold of, so I've been ordering a, uh, I've ordered a gallon of it, uh, laboratory-grade stuff. Not that it needs to be that, um, but I wanted a gallon of it. I wanted it in quantity. I like to buy most things in quantity. I buy the, the glues that I use for plastic solvents, the methyl alpha ketone, and, um, uh, methylated chlorine. Uh, I buy those in gallons. Uh, I buy, you know, paint thinner or, or uh, mineral spirits. I buy that by the gallon. I, I buy everything that I can buy, I buy in larger quantities. Not because, uh, not because I'm really trying to get a significant uh, economic discount, but just because I just don't want to chase the products. I just, when I have time to model, I want the mediums to work with the model. The, the thing that I have the the, sh the biggest deficit of is is time. But I've airbrushed a number of colors, building up some layers. This area along the right of way uh, here I made fairly wide. On the prototype there's a little bit of an access road there, but it doesn't look like an access road. It's just a fairly wide, flat area that is pretty dark. And I'm having to practice and, and refine my airbrushing techniques. I, I haven't been at airbrushing or painting very long. But I haven't been afraid to experiment with it or try. I've been I've airbrushed some freight cars, I've been putting a uh, clear coat on with an airbrush, I've been fading with an airbrush per Ralph uh, Rizzetti, the Mudfather, for his uh, help and instructions uh, via our nightly chats and via his really excellent weathering series on uh, Auto Run Love. And I, I think the airbrush has become one of my favorite tools. 
as I've said many times before, I'm really an itchy deer and I'm very much a dotted artist. So, um, airbrush and, and that kind of techniques are not really that natural to me. I really enjoy working with an airbrush, it's a really fun tool. Of alcohol at times, as I work with getting the right consistency, messing with the colors to get the right colors. I'm not a natural at any of this, so I've had to you know, mix grays and browns and stuff together. Some things that have worked real well is to, I, I have not had good luck using strong blacks. I think this is a, it's, it's not a black, it's a very dark color, but it's not a black. But I'm very gentle with really dark colors. I pretty much have decided never to use a straight black, at least not in cedar. Work. This is one of my little cheaper airbrushes. I've got several at this point. Um, this little uh, $50 airbrush or something works really great for cedar products and our cedar work. I'm, I'm not at all afraid to use it or, or to mess it up. It wasn't an expensive purchase. So. these sharper uh, hillside profiles of the sharp uh, this of uh, this waterway obviously a waterway um, this little creek um, you definitely got to kind of press the, the ground into it to get it to bite into that glue and it sometimes takes a couple coats to get it to cover too now with using dirt and uh, cedary colors in the initial application that was always a positive allow me to, to add different color varieties to it, but if I'm, if I'm gonna, gonna stick with using uh, white or gray or whatever, some base color grout and get all of my color in the painting process or airbrushing process after, I really wanted to cover a little better, so. Now this little spoon, I, I've had this a long time, worked at a, a soil and water lab years ago. I've had that since since I was there and it's the perfect little tool for, for setting application. And I cleaned all the the stuff that didn't stick down of this grout product, cleaned it all off and sprayed it all off and it's still dust is still blown away from it. So it, it is a somewhat dusty medium. Uh, and what I'm using in this area because I want a fairly fine contour is uh, unsanded grout so it's really quite fine. But what I'm looking for there is, is dirt, so really not much gravel. I make a come back and put some gravel contours over when I figure exactly how I want the water to look before I uh, raise it or whatever I end up doing here. Now I've swapped modules and you'll see some changes uh, here in a minute too because uh, I, I've now taken the modules home. You'll see those before long again in place, but. I'm going to be working back and forth a little bit this month on two modules because I have them at various levels of completion. You can see I'm starting to track work in the back. I know this seems kind of counter to a lot of people's thought process, but I lay track pretty late in the process. And part of the reason that I do that is I really want to be quite sure that I like where I'm going, um, that I like where I'm going with everything before I commit to track work. My track work is, is time consuming. So I really want the scenery to be pretty doggone close because if I need to make it, and I want the look, overall look, the, the track plan, the track alignment, how it all fits in, the, 
the scenery, the tree placement. I want the, uh, there's already a road installed at the back. You can see that. I want all of that to, to work pretty well together. And if I need to make changes, I want to figure that out before I start putting track work down because my track work is incredibly time consuming to install. So now this module I'll be using kind of a mix of a couple different track laying techniques, but the most foreground track will be by hand laying track with the individual tie plates. And that track has uh, 502 parts. Uh, I think it's 502 parts uh, for a three foot section. So uh, I think it's worth it. But, and I'm really loving the results with airbrushing this this texture. So put you know this grout texture on and airbrush it, and I can get very good dirt looking effects. And I've slowly come to this realization anyway through my own mechanisms. Um, because I've come to really like a dry brushing uh, technique, and I started out with ballast, where I, I put my ballast down, and I make my own ballast, I put my ballast down, uh, I use a dark wash on it to kind of soak in, you know, I'm basically painting in the shadows that are cast by the particulate gradles of, of the ballast, and then I come back and dry brush over the over top of it. And you can see my airbrush technique is not spectacular as I've dropped, dropped a little paint. I haven't used airbrush that long, so there's some muscle memory that I'm sure I'll develop as time goes on, but, but you don't have to be an expert or, or really that comfortable with it to use it. I'm not that far along and I'm, I'm getting good results. And I can always come, I will come back as I make this little gravel road through here, I'll come back and put the, the gray color over top of that for the, for the pathway for the uh, car tracks or the wheel tread tracks. Along. They'll go right over top of the old spot where I dropped the little pipe. No big deal. And most of this is static grass anyway. A static grass or grass mats. May use some grass mats here. adhesive mixed in, uh, add a little water, and it's basically the same thing as the Hobosote ballast I've used, or the Hobosote road bed I'm using. Hobosote is just compressed paper, so compressed recycled paper. So it's got that shape right. Come in and fix some of the areas where I could have dug into that with some actual ground fuel, which is the same paper mache product. I just added some paint to it. The Adding the latex paint to it gives it color, of course, but it also adds a latex property to it. I don't generally like that on my road bed where track lays across it so I mean if I'm shaping along the right of way uh, it doesn't matter I'll use paper mache if I'm just doing that if I'm doing something with ground coop uh, I'll use that for uh, road uh, for the for the sides for the, the ballast profiles and stuff but if the tracks don't lay across it I really prefer that to be hobosote or just paper mache Tours to make it look like the road has a, has 
that center burner that's kind of worn out over time. I slightly exaggerated this effect uh, initially, but I've kind of come back to the folks. So, but some effects don't scale properly. So if you have a, a depressed road profile that's depressed two or three inches where car tracks run over it, um, you, you'll see that in the real world, but you're never going to see the millimeter of depression that would, that, or less than a millimeter of depression that would be there at HL scale. Uh, remember, um, a foot is 3.5 millimeters at HL scale, so if you're trying to model two inch depression or something, you're modeling some one millimeter, that's, you're know, about one millimeter. That's not going to, it's not going to show very well. So there's a few things that have to be slightly exaggerated, slightly, in order to get them visible, to make them visible. Uh, part of this has to do with just physics. Light, gravity, effects such as that just work different as they're scaling down. It's part of the reason the subwavering effects don't work exactly the same as Ralph will tell you. Uh, it's true while weight doesn't work doesn't work exactly the same. I mean, you wouldn't take a 100-ton a coal hopper and scale that down by 187 and have, you know, a ton and a little bit, you know, or two ton freight car, you'd never move it. So, these things scale, there's some proportionality there too. It's not a direct one to 87 scale proportion anyway because they're kind of cute those things. But there's some complex, there's some math involved in that. But just everything doesn't scale that properly. And it just needs to, it needs to look right to the eye when it comes to the scenic and some of these effects. And there's other effects that, that the prototype really matters on. So I really care a lot about the prototype when it comes to track alignment and the details because I'm going to operate prototypically. In my case, I know that my operations will work because they work for the Norfolk at Western and later Norfolk Southern. I know they're going to work for me. I didn't invent my track alignment or track work scheme. I just replicated what was there on the prototype. Since I replicated that, I know it worked for them. I'm sure it worked for me. So after getting these contours, getting some texture uh, down on the on everything, getting some color down on everything. Uh, you know, there's a few things upcoming now, so it's, now it's time. Uh, I've already started since all these videos. I've already started uh, very seriously committed to getting track and wiring the modules. Uh, I do that in a bit of a funny order as well, too. So I've already I've already started on wiring, uh, but I've already got part of the track laid too. So I'm kind of wiring and tra leg track uh, simultaneously. And I'm pretty far along on those projects at this point on this module. But now I've got all the basic contours in place, so it's time for static grass. I've already got a lot of trees planted, but at this point, the only thing I have to do is kind of the finishing products. That's planting trees, static grass, in my case, lake track, and wiring come afterwards. The lighting is already integrated into the module, so I'm going to final shaping on the back before I get the final textures and airbrush on there. And I've come real far on these modules, and they're very nearly done. You'll see them next month. You'll see us for our live show next month. We're, we're 